couple of the answers, but together we've probably got a better shot at finding them. Um, so it really is a four schools by schools series of webinars um, that are designed just to share practices and approaches um, and give you an opportunity to ask, ask any questions you might have um, and learn from one another really. So um, lovely to have you here and I'm going to hand over to Gareth and Helen who will be far more interesting than I could ever hope to be. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Louise. I hope that um, what we share will be interesting to people. I'm just going to start to share my screen now. So please, will you let me know if it works? Can you see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, so I'm going to go into presentation mode so all the videos play and so on. And that means then I won't be able to see you. So you'll have to uh, just shout out if there's anything that goes wrong with the technology. <laughs> so. So just like everybody, St Peter's is doing the best job that it can. We are not today saying that our synchronous learning is fantastic. We're saying that we tried to focus on what would make good synchronous learning before we started, and I think that helped. And we already believed that we were building on good foundations of asynchronous learning going all the way back to last April. So just a bit of background. In the summer term, we provided videos for pupils and they were watching three videos a day plus they had follow-up work and teachers were recording those videos within the year groups. St Peter's is a two form entry school with a couple of three forms um, and that meant that teachers were able to share that workload which was really important. Throughout the autumn term we spent a long time, um, a lot of time I should say, training in terms of what makes good blended learning and then we shifted our focus to what makes good live lessons. And so we attended some training in the summer with Teacher Ka Champion people, so Doug Lamov and his team, and then CSC, of course, provided some fantastic training with Doug Lamov and his team. And we, of course, read everything that we possibly could on the internet. So we spent a lot of our professional learning time in the autumn term expecting another lockdown at some time and getting ready for that. So what would we do when that lockdown comes? So what you're going to see today is a combination of the training that we provided for our staff and what has happened with that training. So some videos of the actual practice within our school. So some of the focus points for the training today and for our professional learning the autumn term involve these areas here. So this is uh, in terms of kind of uncommon schools and teacher champion and Doug Lamov and all of that kind of practice. This, te this terminology is very much from that work. So you're going to look at how we dissolve the screen. We're going to look at how we <coughs> help pupils to have what they need and to know what they need through orientation screens. We're going to talk about the very, very important clear procedures and routines that we have tried to carry on from the classroom. So lots of what you'll hear today about procedures and routines will have been established in the classroom prior to the lockdown. We're going to look at how we try and engage learners so that they're participating in the lessons as much as possible, and then how we hold children accountable. So this is not accountability in terms of our teachers and making sure that they're doing what they should. This is making sure that the work that goes on in a lesson is the children doing the work and how we can see that that's going on. It's going to hand over to Helen now for the first part of that. OK, thanks, Gareth. So um, we firstly looked at dissolving the screen. So obviously we build up these wonderful relationships with our children when we're in class with them. And it's very easy to do that because we're all in the same room, etc. But our real focus, our question was, how do we continue to build and maintain our connections with the children when we're leaving the classroom behind? So the dissolving of the screen is just to heighten and strengthen the children's awareness that we are still there, we're still together um, and we can still um, we can still create that relationship that we've got. So the points for dissolving the screen are just there um, on the screen. So to be warm and reassuring, to make sure there's a fast start to the lesson. And then the next three, making it feel like we're in the same room, focusing on achievement and the work you do matters. We're going to watch a video now from, um, <clears throat> from Teach Like a Champion, from someone called Rachel Shin. And she really shows those three points there. She really shows them off. So we'll watch that video and then you can have a little think about how she's done that. Hello, welcome back, day two of Snack Stories. If you're excited, give me a big thumbs up. Great. 
I'm excited that I'm here with all of you. We're ready to go for day two. Okay. So today the story problem has some has a question about paper clips. And, and so here's the challenge for tomorrow. If you want to be featured in the tomorrow story problem, write down your answer, show us your strategy, and the first person to show a strategy um, or comment below will be featured in tomorrow's story problem. Okay, great. Thank you so much, friends. Today's problem is actually brought to you by Nicholas. Nicholas did so much work yesterday on his story problem and sent me a lot of his pictures. So I'm going to talk about Nicholas and his favorite thing in the world today are Legos. So let's get started. Okay, so we can see there that Rachel was welcoming, she was smiling, but she got on with that lesson straight away and she had the personal touch. So she was highlighting a child's work from the day before and she was using his interest. So she was incentivizing all of the children to want to be involved. Um, and that's something that we do in the classroom and that's how we dissolve that screen. So once we've dissolved that screen then, we need to think about how we can prepare the children for the lesson. So obviously, as we know, we need to be prepared. We need to be planned for the work we're doing, but we also need to make it easy for the children and for them to be relaxed and feel that they're happy to learn in this strange environment. So we thought about how we can ensure the children can get on with their learning um, and making sure they're prepared and have everything they need. So we looked at orientation screens. So we're going to show you some examples of orientation screens that we've used within our classroom and the first is from our year one teacher. Welcome to today's come and see lesson. What you're going to need today is a pen or paper, a pen and paper, I mean pencil actually, um, or a whiteboard and a whiteboard pen. You don't need it just yet but there will be a part in this lesson where I will ask you to write something down or draw a picture this time, okay? So if you need to get that out now, please do so while we're just going over the structure of today's lesson. And as always, from this lesson, I need really good focus because when you're focusing and I can see you're learning, it makes the lesson so much better. OK, so expectations, you know now, we'll just go through this quickly. Please stay on mute unless called on by an adult or if you need to say something really important. Please sit in star with nothing in your hands because it can be a little distracting if we're waving things around or have a toy or something in our hands. And as you would do in class, please put your hand up if you have a question. OK, so that was for our year one children. We also um, obviously the younger children as well need to have those icons, etc. So our um, reception teachers would use this as their um, as their screen initially to talk the children through expectations. So they understand if they see these, they understand they should have their uh, the mute should be on. They understand the star sitting that's expected of them and they understand that they need to have good focus. And so it's just ensuring that they they know what's expected of them and they're ready to learn. And then obviously we've moved throughout the school to our expectations for the older children. So again, there's that star word, which is um, a technique that we use in school that all children understand what's expected expected of them and the way that they should be sitting, uh, the mute, the icons for raising hand, chat, and then some techniques that we use, cold call and pass it on. So it's just making sure again the children are confident and ready to learn um, and they know this lesson is going to start and they know that's the way um, that's the way they need to behave etc throughout the lesson. Uh, we also think about those children who can't reliably read. So if you just watch the next video and have a think about its strengths, please feel free to make some notes. Hello, mathematicians. We are going to be working on lesson four of your math packet. Today, you will need two sharpened pencils, your student work packet, turn to math lesson four. It should look like this and your bag of Unifix cubes. OK, so there, uh, Keila Fernandez has focused on the icons for the children. So she's shown them what's expected of them. Um, and we've ensured throughout our school we sent learning packs home. So we're aware of the resources that children do have at home. So we know they'll have a pencil and um, they've sent home a learning pack. We put the um, 
the worksheets, etc., onto Seesaw or Google Classroom. So we know they've got those resources. And then obviously there they're asking for some Unifix cubes. Well, again, we would ensure that we had sent those home with the children. So we know those resources are there and they are easy for the children to get. Um, we also then moved on to holding screens. So this is an example of our year five holding screen. Um, and these really became um, very helpful for our synchronous teaching. So about five minutes before the lesson began, we would put this up, we would bring the children in from the lobby um, and it would just give them five minutes to read the um, expectations and to go and get what they need. Because it all in the beginning, you would um, be teaching the children and you'd say, right, so get your pencil. And you could see them just thinking, oh, I need to depend Oh, I didn't think I'd need one. And so this really makes sure now that they're focused and they're fully on task, ready to start. So these were a really positive, uh, the holding screen especially was really positive for us to get going with our lessons. And so then the positives of them are they use a combination of pictures, icons and words, really simple and easy to follow. They minimise distracting information, which is very important. And then it's really important, again, we talk about dissolving that screen as well, but for the teacher to be heard, so you had examples of that as well, the voiceover or their face alongside the screen. So they can always see you, they can always hear you, they know you're always there. Thanks, Helen. So just some uh, things that we did then to get ready for live lessons especially. So during the autumn term, we made sure that the children had practiced using Seesaw a lot, which they had become very accustomed to since the first lockdown, but also making sure that children in Key Stage 2 were using Google Classroom really well. So how proficient were they with slides and with docs and with forms and all those different aspects? How well were they using Hub and J2E? So all the different things that we would know that we would want them to use both in school, but also then at home and how they might use them at home were practiced during the autumn term. So preparation of the lockdown that was going to come um, was really key to us. And then again, we gave out passwords and uh, user login details so many times over. And of course, like all schools in the first week then of the lockdown, we had phone calls um, to the office saying, I've lost my child's password, I can't find it. It would save on the computer and we've refreshed the computer or we've changed our device. And so the office just made sure that they had all of those passwords there ready so that teachers weren't being disturbed. And that was really important, too, that we allowed the teachers to focus on what they were doing. And the office, we through a help desk email, was able to answer all of those kind of questions. We put a lot of communication with parents both prior to lockdown, on the day that lockdown was announced, and then continuing, in, especially in the early stages of when children were learning at home. So we were communicating with parents a lot via email, via um, app messages through our school website and then of course through phone calls for those families who needed that and through our communication and questionnaires where parents were able to say what they had at home so in terms of the internet or devices we were ready to go from the first day so we had over 50 families who turned up by the first day so that they had it ready to start on that very very first day of home learning but within a week we'd given out about 90 and then by now, we've now given out over 120 devices. And that was a mixture initially of iPads for younger children and Chromebooks. But as it turned out, everybody using Teams had a better experience on Chromebooks. So again, we learned that quite quickly and we allow parents to come and swap those devices at the school. The learning packs were really important. So throughout the autumn term, we had ordered a lot of whiteboards, whiteboard pens, packets of colored pencils, um, spare exercise books, pencil for the children to take home, Unifix cubes. So we thought, what would the children need if they're going to be at home for a week or a month or even a term? And how can we make sure that the day that we break up and we, we go on into another lockdown, how can we make sure that they have that on that day? So that's exactly what we had done. We'd only needed year six to isolate prior to Christmas. So we were really lucky in terms of COVID transmission and so on in that regard. We had those packs ready for those isolation events. So the year one children had already taken home a pack. And then all of the other year groups took home their learning packs when lockdown was announced. So, so just like that screen you saw just now um, where they were saying you need Unifix cubes, we knew that our reception children or year one children had those very things at home because we had provided them. 
And anybody who was away on that day, we did allow them to come to the school to pick them up. And then we even just posted some extra sheets that we thought year six would want as well. Um, we held a parents question and answer session after eight days of learning at home. So by that time, we knew that families would have found problems or would have found that things had moved on. So rather than doing it on the third day or the second day, when there were still lots of technology issues, we just allowed it to go a week and a bit. And then we had a live Q&A, 45 different families turned up to that, and they gave us some great feedback that allowed us to improve things from the very next day. Um, so that, that communication that was two-way, not just from us, was also really important. And then, of course, engagement tracking, like all schools, we were tracking which children were taking part, how often they were taking part, were they also then doing follow-up work, so the asynchronous work that complemented the live lessons. And we got to the stage where it was around sort of the 60 odd percent mark in the first week. Then by the third week, we were touching 80 percent of children in the school taking part. And all the families who weren't taking part had phone calls. Our deputy head teacher and safeguarding officer was making phone calls saying, why are you not taking part? What is it that we can do to help you? How can we encourage you? And so we, we in some year groups, then we even went up to 90 percent. Um, and that's pretty much where we are now in key stage two. OK, so so kind of back to the training elements, then the strong procedures and routines that are needed in school equally are needed at home. So Helen has already mentioned the star sitting where we expect pupils to sit with straight backs, with their hands in their lap so that they're not distracting each other in the classroom. We use that still at home. So we use that language of sit in star, return to star. And, and it's incredible to watch on the screen. And I've joined in quite a few lessons. As soon as the teachers say star, the pupils, even in their own homes, sit up, face the camera, and we use the language of track me, and they do exactly that. And the message that we're giving is, during the live lesson, this is still a classroom, and you still need to engage in the best possible way. And we found that all the way from nursery right the way through to year six, that's exactly what happened. So we've got some videos now of not just those basics of sitting in star and tracking the screen and so on, but also some other things about how children are expected to have their pen ready to write or at the end to show that they finished writing or how other routines of the teachers saying you've got 30 seconds and this is what I want you to do by then and then I want you to post in the chat and all those different sorts of things. And then after the videos, I'm just going to allow you to have a little bit of time to maybe make some notes. So here we go. Want to want to ask questions all the time, just like in class when we do vertical hands. When someone else is speaking, um, we lower our hands while they're giving their answer. So if we can maintain that, it'll be great. Okay. So today I will be using a few techniques. Um, I will ask for people to give answers. Uh, I will use three, two, one, show me on a, with everybody right on the whiteboard, and I might do a little bit of cold calling, which means I just ask people by name um, to give their to give their answer. OK, David, so if for, for today, just write in the comments. OK, that's not a problem. The white goes not breaking out. So very simply, Chris there, this is in the second week of children learning at home and the synchronous lessons. Chris is just going over the established routines from the week before, and he's just reminding the children this lesson, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I expect of you. So they know the terms like call, call, vertical hands, they're exactly what the children are expected to do in the classroom. And we're saying we still want you to do that in the home. I want to I want to ask questions all this. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Lovely. Thank you very much. We'll have one more. Edward, please could you give us your answer one of your answers? The album then is the worst of the egg. Good. Well then that was one of the, those tricky words, wasn't it, to say as well. Thank you ever so much. Twelve and children. Good job. Wipe that board clean please and show me you're ready with your whiteboard pen up in the air. So waiting on some just to finish, wiping that off, whiteboard pen up in the air. Good morning, Austin, you've joined, yep. Okay, right, children, thank you for showing me that you're ready. Um, we are going to look at... In so something as simple as wipe your whiteboards and then show me that you're ready 
as you know, in the classroom, that's a lot of fuss often, but through those fantastic routines and procedures in the classroom, and then exactly the same in the home, hold up your pen so I can see everybody is ready on the camera, and then Frank can wait so that they're not focusing on their whiteboard still, they are all looking at her before she will move on with the lesson. Something as simple as that can just make a huge difference in terms of attention, and of course attention then going on to learning. Okay, so before we do anything on your whiteboard, okay, in one minute, I want you to write down one word for each of the five different spelling codes for the O phoneme. So not just OE words, okay, not words with just the OE spelling, words with all the different spellings for that O sound, okay? So one minute, starting from now. Let's go. And show me star in tree, die in, show me star, or down a beaner, down a melee, or down head. Fantastic. Okay, right. So, so Tom, they're using exactly the same routines of show me star. Um, you've got one minute and keep into that one minute, and then he's using his second screen to keep an eye on the children whilst he's got his screen in front of him to make sure that he's able to follow. What, what the children can see with his PowerPoint presentation or his Google Slides. So very simple routines and procedures from the classroom that have then been re-established in the home or even new procedures that have been established in the first days. And so just, I'll allow you to read what's on the screen. These are the things that we felt were very, very important to us. So that first week of live lessons at home was really important to establish these procedures and routines so that now in the sort of fifth and sixth week, then pupils are just able to start the lesson immediately, teachers can go, and the whole of the 45 minutes or 55 minutes in the Key Stage 2 lessons is used for learning rather than fussing, which is what we're trying to avoid through all of these um, established procedures and routines. Thanks, Helen. <clears throat> Sorry, we're going to think about uh, means of participation now. So these are any of the many ways that teachers can ensure active child participation in lessons. So if you just read through those five bullet points, why? Why do we want to think about that? So it's ensuring that the children know they're still expected to engage and participate. It's ensuring they're paying attention. Um, it's something that we can do in the classroom. We can have this variety of participation, this variety of activities in the classroom. It's harder to do that online. So we really wanted to focus on the different um, activities that we could bring online that would ensure um, that fast pace as well to keep that lesson going so they are still engaged and participating. And then the really important one is about being electronic or paper based. We all know about screen fatigue. We all know how hard it is to constantly be working on a screen. So we just think about what else could we introduce? What other activities could we give the children? For example, whiteboards, um, writing, um, just pencil and paper, things like that, just to change it up a little bit and make them more interested and not just become bored of looking at a screen all the time. Um, and then the reasons why, why do we want to think about and use these? So it's allowing us as a teacher to check for understanding. So we can change our teaching then based on the children's response and their feedback and we can give feedback to pupils there and then um, and we can use the different uh, activities and the different um, ways that we want them to engage to really ensure that they're understanding and they're getting what we want them where they're learning what we want them to learn so we're going to show you some videos now Ten. go on that's fine okay. this is danielle um, in our year five class Ten seconds. <laughs> as many answers as you can. Dion, Evie for correcting yourself. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, Hannah, I'm going to cold call you. Could you please share your answer for me, please? Dioch and Val. So we should type it in the chat now. Dioch, excellent. 
and I'm cold calling you. Can you share your answer, please? A syllable added to the start of a root word. The Ochen vowel. So a prefix, and most of you wrote that in the chat, and I was really impressed, Evie, that you corrected yourself. A prefix syllable placed in front of a root word. And a prefix always changes the meaning of the word. So the prefixes that we're looking at today is this and miss. Does anybody know, and don't worry if you don't, what this or miss can mean, how they can change a root word? I'm looking for hands up here. We'll go with this first. So, Evie, what do you think this means? Um, not. What? Excellent. Thank you. So this means not. And what does miss mean? Miss, any hands up for miss? Think of words with miss at the beginning. Sure, okay, that's absolutely fine. So this is not a miss, is. Juan Leonardo, what's miss? Wrong. Wrong, excellent. Good, thank you, Bo. This is not and this is wrong. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, so where that we're looking at today, where we're going to be adding prefixes, where we're going to be adding syllables at the beginning of a root word, um, are verbs. I'm going to ask you now to type in the chat is a verb. What do we mean by the term verb? Verb. And I will be also cold calling children. So we've got 30 seconds. What do we mean by the word verb? What's a verb? Okay, so what's really good there is what Danielle has done. She's used three different um, techniques to get the children to answer the questions. So she's given them lots of um, chances to answer in different ways. She's used the cold call. She's given them the opportunity to type in the chat and put their hands up. So it's just keeping them listening, keeping them paying attention and making sure that they're thinking, right, what's, she, you know, what's my teacher going to ask me next? What way am I going to answer this one? So it's just keeping it a little bit more exciting for them as well. The next... Um, video we're going to show you is from one of our year three teachers and she uses something that we call waterfall so basically she holds them off from type from putting their answer from pressing send in the chat until she's given them all an opportunity to um to be able to put their answer into the chat so if you have a little look at this one and i i will ask the question again what is the big hot bright object you can see in the sky during the day? Write it into the chat, but do not press send. Write it into the chat, but do not press send. We are going to click send all at the same time. We are going to click enter all at the same time. So what is the big hot bright object we can see in the sky during the day? Get those fingers hovering over that button. Press send in three. In two. Go, 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 go. Press send, press send, press send. Amazing. I'm seeing lots of correct answers there. It is, of course, the sun. Okay, get ready to write something new into that chat box. Your second question. Poissine Barrel, let me see those star sitters. Let me see those star sitters. Goodness me, boys and girls, your behavior is impeccable. You are brilliant. What is the big object you can see in the sky at night that appears to be glowing? What is the big thing? Don't press send. Teresa, don't you press send. Abigail, don't you press send yet? Type it in there. Okay. DJ, don't press send yet. Three, two, one, go. Send, send, send. Oh my God, look at you. You are so great at this. 
And then um, what well, we, we really love this video because Hannah is exactly like that, um, that positive relationship and that real um, enthusiasm that she has there. She's got that with the children, whether she's in the classroom or online. Um, and she, she obviously knows her children that she's teaching so well and she knows um, you know, how to hold them off from press and send, et cetera. So we, um, she uses that waterfall technique really, really well there. Um, and she's able then to see which children are getting it, which children maybe don't understand it. And she's used something there called real time accountability. So, and Danielle as well. So it's getting that answer from the children straight away. Um, so there are other types of accountability. There's other ways that we can ensure that the children are learning and the children are engaging. Um, and there are three types that, uh, that we get out of our lessons. And it's the implicit accountability, lagging accountability. And then you've just seen the examples there of real time accountability. So the implicit accountability is really giving children um, an opportunity to take responsibility for their own learning. So you would say to them, I'm going to ask you some questions, write the answers, and then in five minutes, I'm going to give you those answers. So you're trusting, you've got that culture of trust where you're really trusting that the children are going to write the answers when you've asked them to. And then five minutes later, still in that online lesson, you're going to talk about giving, you're going to give them the answers and you're going to talk about those answers. So in our first um, column there, we've got um, examples of implicit, and then there's some positives in that third row down um, it does allow quick assessment and it can help the children build their own ownership of learning but then obviously there are some sort of you know some of those children might not be doing the activity you've asked them to do and you as a teacher aren't sure they're completing it but as I said it's that culture of trust isn't it You've also got the lagging accountability. So again, a different type of activity where you say to the children, this is what we're doing and I'd like to see your answers by 3.30, please. Again, we would do that through Seesaw or Google Forms or Google Docs or whatever the activity requested, maybe uploading their notes via a photograph. Um, and then again, in that third row, you've got the positives of that. So you can think and forward plan as a teacher and you can thoroughly check. Um, but also um, there's that time consuming, um, you know, if the children are not understanding it, if you need to go back and go over, et cetera, and that lag before the feedback. So this is where you would take those um, pieces of work the children have done and then you'd go through them the next day in the next lesson. You'd use them as examples of good work, et cetera, or examples where maybe all the children didn't understand or you wanted to go over something. And then as just you've seen, there's the real time accountability. So again, you can use the chat for that, hands up for that. Um, and again, as always, um, the positives, you've got the attention, you've got the engagement of the children. But again, maybe perhaps it could slow down the pace of the lesson, depending on how you use it. So it's making sure you're keeping that lesson pacey as well. So we are going to show you now another example of a video. Um, and this is a technique that we've introduced in our school called Front the Writing, where the children have two opportunities in the lesson to write. So the first opportunity, you put the writing earlier in the lesson to ensure the children are engaged, they can process their thinking, they can refine their thinking prior to discussion. Then you have your lesson, you discuss uh, the focus point of the lesson, etc. You talk about it, you do your teaching, and then you ask the children to write again. And you'll see that now. Um, and it, it enables the children, as I've said, to help them with their thinking and their processing. But it also helps the teachers assess the children's understanding and to react accordingly. Um, and in this uh, video we're going to show you now, one of our children um, is reading through his second piece of work. And it's great that he's improved his piece of work already from the beginning to the end of the lesson. But what's also a real positive here is that as he's reading, he's evaluating and you can see he pauses because he realises that he actually could have improved even more. And it's just a really lovely thing to see that he's assessing the work he's done himself. So we'll show you that video now. Day, you had a task to read chapter four about Joyce Russell, and you also read it with Mr. Wilde last week. So your front the writing task is to write a paragraph summarising what you learned about joints and muscles. So just on the left hand box, you're going to write a paragraph summarising what you learned, a paragraph. Are there any questions you've read? Go on, Daniel, this is good. In paragraph four of House Body Works, I learned about two subjects. Firstly, 
Then it the joints less of muscles and body parts and muscles. And muscles less of run than and crawl. Yeah. So you need another comma in there. Good boy, carry on. Then run, jump, crawl and walk. Oh, die out. Then cartilage patients are drunk so they don't rub. Fire away. Lastly, point of care calls Achilles. He was dipped in the steps with vulnerable. But his heel was not he was shot by a stomach and died. So there is a tendon in the heel of the Achilles tendon. Our body is amazing. Fantastic, Dan. So you've got an indentation, topic sentence, concluding sentence. You've included as well some time connectives. Excellent. What might you do, Dan, just to improve it a little bit? So there's the real positive there of that um, online, bringing some of our um, means of participation, bringing them online. And there you can see how Daniel really focused on how to improve his work and did. And again, was still assessing himself as he read it through and all of his um, peers would have been seeing that process also. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. So what, what that video really shows Okay, so what the video is really showing us is how to work within the lesson, the children are held to account. So we're not just delivering, we're not just lecturing, we're helping to instruct, but we're also saying to the children, the work that you're doing in this lesson matters, and you're going to improve your learning in exactly the same way you would in the classroom. And I know that all schools have got better at this throughout the time that we've been at home, but this is what we really like about what's going well here in St. Peter's School, is that from the asynchronous lessons that we were providing in the summer term that we were really happy with, those videos that children could stop and pause and rewatch and learn from, these, these live lessons we think have taken things to another level and parents certainly agree with us, that we're able to actually show development of pupils' work even within the lesson. And I think where you can see there that Daniel has improved from his first attempt at his paragraph to his second one, which is still not perfect. He's still got punctuation issues and spelling issues and all the things that we would want him to improve next. But you can see how he's being held to account and he's having that attempt at trying to improve his work and improve his learning during that 45 or 55 minute lesson there. So, so just then to kind of sum up where we think that um, things have gone well, we try to evaluate and where we think we need to do better in future. And we've done that every single week. So what's been, in fact, my favorite bit as the head teacher, of course, working with staff rather than always directly with pupils, is that every single Thursday at one o'clock, all of the teachers at the school, and quite often the TAs too, come to a review meeting online. So we discuss what's gone well in the week. We would do things like share the front the writing. We would say, this went well for me in year five. How would it work in year one? Would we adapt it? Would we use it in any way in, in foundation phase? So those kind of conversations happen for an hour every Thursday afternoon. So people come along with, they, there's not exactly an agenda as such. It's just people come along with, we've done this, we tried it out. We had our professional learning session on Monday. We had to go by Thursday. We can see that these things have worked well. So we've been able to make improvements in every single week since the lockdown started because of these review meetings and because of our professional learning sessions. And that for me has been a real positive of the whole experience for us in St. Peter's. We of course have had emails from parents where they've had technology issues or where they maybe think that they would like five live lessons a day. And we go back and we say, of course, we don't actually think that that's reasonable both for the child and for the school. Or we, many, many more emails have been from parents telling us what a great job they think that we're doing. And we're all, always, of course, you know, delighted to see, to see those. Um, we've been keeping on with our phone calls to the families who aren't engaging and saying, well, come on then, you know, you're only doing one lesson a week or you're not engaging at all. What is it that's going on there? And then for some families, they've just said, we don't want to. And then there's not really much that we can do there. The questionnaires, we're going to have just a very, very quick look at a little bit of feedback from questionnaires that we've sent out to parents and pupils asking them how, they, how well they think things are going have been really good to help us review and evaluate and then hopefully make future improvements. And then we've also used the Central South Consortium documents like the one on the screen. So we divided the different parts of this document up between teams using breakout rooms 
And then in our breakout rooms, different teams from across the school looked at different parts of this document. And then we helped to put that together as a global review. And that's been really, really helpful to us. The questions in this document are fantastic. Um, seeing what the teachers think about how well they're going, not just then in those incidental Thursday review meetings, but also then using the questions that have come from the CSC have been very, very helpful to us. Um, and then this is what the pupils thought. So this is how many pupils answered the survey. 51 pupils completed the questionnaire, um, which was a, a, a decent rate. Um, Actually, 46 is slightly higher than I expected. I thought lots might say it was either too easy or and, and then maybe even a little bit more too hard. But, it, you know, it's great that a high percentage think that it's just right for them. Um, and then pupils having what they need for home learning. Um, what was a little bit sad about this, actually, was that the three pupils who said they didn't have what they need were things that we couldn't provide. Like some said, I need a room without any distractions. And others said, I need a better desk to work at. So, so you know, God bless them. We would love to provide those things. Um, but what we were able to do there with this question is try and find out, do they think that they need something that they didn't have? And, and none of that came through from those 51. What we've learned through that questionnaire is rather than it being a choice, in fact, in future, the next time we do such a questionnaire, we do it as a lesson. So we'd have an, an even higher take up rate than 51. Um, and then with parents, uh, we had again a good rate that, that answered. It was actually um, uh, some parents had two or three children in the school. So it was around 50 different families um, that made up the, the 80 odd um, different questionnaires. But what was good again is that it was a high rate. Out of the eight, five thought that they were too long and three thought they were too short. But we think actually, generally, with that feedback and with our teacher evaluation, we think the lesson length is about right. So that's around 10 to 15 minutes in reception and nursery, around 25 to 30 minutes in year one and two. And they're around 45 minutes to an hour in key stage two, those live lessons. And they've worked well for us. Um, and then this one was, you know, kind of do we really want to know what parents think about the lessons? Um, so this one was a little bit nerve wracking, maybe sending out. Um, and I would, I thought that good would come back as the main one. But again, out of those parents who filled in the questionnaire, it was great to see that lots of them thought they were excellent or good. Just a few fair. And again, when they then made comments following up why they said fair or why they said good, those evaluative comments have been just as helpful as the actual judgment itself. Um, and, and, you know, we would have taken it on the chin if anyone would have said poor, but it's nice that they didn't. Um, and then... Overall, these are the things that we thought, right, so these are the things that if we were trying to say to other places, what um, have we taken from elsewhere? We took these from the CSC and we used these comments to be able to say, are we doing all of these things? And these were really helpful to us. And then just the last one is kind of top tips, what we would say about what makes a good life lesson. Be warm and positive right from the start. It's even harder to connect, as you know, through a screen. Um, so making sure that that dissolving the screen at the start is really well done. Make sure that you're planned and prepared, even more so than in, in school. You need to know and, and have internalized every aspect of the lesson to think what might go wrong. Um, then making sure that we've got pace and challenge. Just because it's at home doesn't mean there should be any less of that. As much as possible, we've tried to have those structures, procedures, routines of the classroom in the home, uh, or we've had to just kind of change them slightly to suit the home setting. And then be, be yourself as much as you want to be like Hannah was. That's how she is with the kids in school. They absolutely adore her because she has that lovely relationship with them, that kind of jokey atmosphere of don't press end, that you know, they know she's joking with them in that style. Just be yourself as a teacher. Come across as much as you can through the screen in the way that you would want to within the classroom. We hope that that's been helpful. Sorry, Louise, if it's been kind of 10 minutes longer than you wanted. But we hope that that's been really helpful. If anybody watching this live now or on video later would like to ask us any questions or would like to know about the questionnaires that we filled in with parents and so on, or would like just a bit more information about any of the techniques that we use, you're very welcome to use these email addresses. Thank you.